This is episode 126 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Welcome to episode 126 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Today, I have Jared Henderson on the show for the second time. He was originally on episode 67, talking about his operations in Peterborough and St. Catharines in Aurelia, Ontario, uh, while he's living in Montreal. Well, Jared has been pivoting a little bit since the lockdown and what's affected his business, and he came on to share where he's focused now and how he's still getting $700 a month in cash flow and buying into deals with multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars of built in equity because of smart buying. Uh, Jared is a guy that doesn't quit and uh, he's quite savvy and he's just constantly looking to grow and build his team with the right people that can help him get to the next level where he's trying to get. So I'm confident you're going to enjoy this episode and it's always great talking to Jared. I love having conversations with like-minded individuals, like-minded investors, and uh, that, hey, that's always what I try and make this show about, just two investors having a conversation. And uh, a lot of what you hear on this show is really just what I would be asking people anyway. Just before we get into the episode, I want to ask you to please just take a moment, please hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell on this video if you have not already done so. Leave me a comment, let me know what you think. If you have any questions or comments, I'd really appreciate it. And also, if you wouldn't mind, if you're an audio listener, please take a moment and rate and review this on Apple Podcasts so that more people can find this show. I really want to thank everyone who's already done this. There are several reviews on there, and the the show has been tracking on the uh, top 50 all-time investing podcasts in Canada. So I want to thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it and certainly couldn't have done it without your help. As always, if you're new to real estate investing or some of these terms aren't completely clicking for you, I highly recommend you go right back to episode one and work your way through. It is a free university education worth of real estate information right here with all these amazing guests that have been on this show. So I'd highly recommend doing that. And without further ado, please enjoy episode 126 with Jared Henderson. Hello and welcome to the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. I have Jared Henderson on the show for the second time for a catch-up episode. Jared, for those who uh, didn't hear the first round, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, we'll go from there. I'm born and raised in Montreal. I've been investing in real estate for almost a decade now. So time is creeping up. I, I focus in Peterborough. That's been my, my market of focus for the last four years. Uh, but I do have a few properties peppered away in uh, Hamilton, Windsor, and Aurelia as well. Yeah, that's a, a trademark of you is that you can, you can do it from a distance, right? You live in Montreal and you're investing kind of all over the place. Yeah, yeah, I actually just picked up a duplex uh, here in Montreal, uh, a few blocks away. So there's just, it's it's handy, you know, here um, we're basically qualified at 5% down. So some huge leverage on that. And uh, it's basically a, a, a nice project for my partner and I to, uh, to, to bond on and get her involved in the real estate game. So it's been fun. Oh, nice. Okay. Are you doing like a, a burr project there? Not even. It was just a... Uh, perfectly laid out and and renovated unit that just required the right buyer and negotiator so we got them down from 650 to 580 uh it just wasn't moving was on the market for too long and uh we were relentless so just got it at a good price in Lachine's an area here in montreal that's gentrifying like a lot of the uh areas just outside of downtown so it's got a strong future value yeah i was gonna ask you about that because i mean montreal values are up so much probably what what in a year 25 percent, 30 percent, something like that yeah which is kind of like the rest of i guess canada or at least southern yeah. ontario and look i i'm the first to admit i can't make the numbers work here in montreal the same way i can in other markets in ontario mm-hmm. so for that reason i steer clear but um there are certain advantages when you can put down five percent and uh, pay a, a 1.75 mortgage uh, there's a lot of benefits to managing the property yourself, right? So I outsource everything to the other properties. And with something like this, it's just when it's easy and it's 5% down, just do it, (laughs) just do it. Can you still make the numbers work though? Can you still cash flow on that? No. No. So it'll be a cash (laughs) negative. But but very slight. So we need a little bit of turnover. We're getting, um, uh, you know, just at a high level, getting uh 13 above 13 below we were thought we were going to get 15 below but uh it was just a tough time we bought it in december 
right? We don't want to wait six months to get tenants in. And we found some fantastic tenants. They're actually ambulance drivers. So, I mean, you, you couldn't get better, more responsible uh, tenants than that. Um, so it, it is slightly cash flow negative. And yes, that does yeah. go against both uh, your, your, yours and my um, principles in real estate, but no you can do it once. You can do it once. <laughs> I okay. look at it as you can have a loser or two if you see a, a, another value in it. It's all relative to your total portfolio. Like if your total portfolio is still cash flow strong and you have a couple that are, are small losers, not such a big deal. But if you're starting out and that's your first and only property, then it becomes a lot bigger. Deal, Never. I think. And, and that's exactly what I tell all my joint venture partners or anyone that has any advice to start out with. Uh, don't Don't go buy that condo for 800 grand. Just don't do it. Yeah. It's become, it's become harder and harder. Right. And I know, you know, kind of beating a dead horse here. We've had this conversation before, but uh, just with the way the values have gone, where do you see your future of investing so that the numbers do work? And what do you consider quote unquote working? I'm looking at other markets now simply because Peterborough is getting a little out of hand. We're starting to see bungalows in the sixes. So, you know, I, I estimate about 75 to 100,000 as uh, the duplex cost. So I, I need, you know, we need meat on the bones. Um, I need to be able to get at least, I, I aim for 75% of my 20% down payment and renovations back once I've refinanced. And, you know, that's after getting a deal, uh, strategically purchasing. Uh, I'm looking at markets like uh, Cornwall. Now, honestly, it's an hour away from Montreal. It's dirt cheap. It's an hour away from Ottawa. And um, the property values are like half of what they are in between Ottawa and, and Montreal. And I, I'm okay diving off to other markets while while sustaining what I have in, in Peterborough as well. My, rents, by the way, and not to go on a tangent, but rents have increased as well mm -hmm. uh, in Peterborough. So it does help. Like when I'm duplexing, these bungalows, I'm getting 2,200 up and 1,800 down, uh, yeah. you know, and at 2% interest. So most of the duplexed bungalows are cash flowing about 500 bucks a month. That's insane. I didn't know it was that high. So you're getting 4,000. Neither did I. You know what? It, it's, it's like Oshawa. Okay. But I mean, that, that sounds higher than Hamilton. Correct me if I'm wrong, unless Hamilton's really jumped up recently uh, for the duplex rentals. I think it's close. So in Hamilton, I, I have partners where we do multifamilies, but I'm familiar with Hamilton on the mountain at, at, a, at a high level where you might be able to get 23 or 24 up if you have a nice three bedroom. And then I don't know what you're getting down, but yeah, it's but similar. It sounds point, like it's similar. It, yeah. It's comparable. It's okay, really so, comparable. So $4,000 a month in rent. That's like, is that pretty standard now for your, your new duplex conversions? These are nicer raised bungalows. It doesn't have to be perfect upstairs, but the downstairs mm -hmm. is brand new, right? You know, you're you're uh, investing $100,000 to completely legalize a two-bedroom suite. Mm -hmm. So, you you know, at you can expect between uh 17 and 1800 dollars for a two-bedroom. As long as you're outside of downtown, you're you'll get that. Okay, so and, do and you have a recent one to mention, that you've done? Oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But one thing to mention as well, this is inclusive. So tenants, I'm covering all the utilities. Gotcha. Which is worth mentioning. I know that changes things. That does. Yeah. I think yeah. normally in Hamilton, they're splitting the utilities uh, and paying similar, but a bit less than, than that. Um, right. Okay. So, so in your recent one, what yeah. were you, what, what were you buying that one for? Uh, so this was a good deal. So I got an off market last year for 350,000. But you just said they're uh, they're going to be in the 600s now. Is that true? Yeah, but you're talking about my deal. Do you want to talk about reality or, or the deals that I get? <laughs> no, let's let's talk about reality. Uh, that's too far off. Okay, so let's go okay. with what okay. would it look like? Okay, so you buy for 600 if you were to do that now? Uh, they're ranging in between five and six, but let's um, let's start at 550. I think that's a good place. I mean, that okay. it, that is a nice, uh, not okay. your grandmother's bungalow where you have to completely redo it. 550 is a good starting point. Okay, and then your reno, you're figuring conservatively 100 grand. Yeah, and sometimes less if they've got a, you know large egress windows downstairs, and you've got the second entrance, yeah. decent ceiling height. All those things help. But if we want to be mm -hmm. conservative, we're going to go 550 purchase, 100 thousand on the reno. 
Okay. So, and that would that include carrying costs and insurance as well, or is that on top? That would be, that would be included. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of people kind of just lump it in. Yeah. We're about a hundred grand, including carrying and all that, um, in debt service. Okay. So you're in for about six fifty, if that's the case. Now, what would something like that be worth if you were to go and refinance it or sell it? Um, that would be worth between seven and seven fifty. Okay. So we'll call it seven twenty five. Yeah. Okay. So something like that, 80% of, uh, of 725, your 580 net investment after kind of considering what you've already got into it, you'd be about $70,000 into the deal. Right. Okay. So let's look at, so rents, you figure 4,000 is achievable between everything. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to zero out vacancy for now. Um, taxes, what, what would you pay for taxes on something like that? Uh, 4,000 a year. So okay. about 320, 350 a month. Okay. And then insurance, what, uh, what's about 1200, 1200. Okay. So you're still getting yeah. a deal on insurance. I've got a good broker. Yeah. It's around that. I, I'm not sure what most people pay. Would it be about 1500 for a single family home or a duplex? It doesn't seem to have a huge, huge impact. It, it depends on if you're getting full replacement value or if you're getting, I forget what they call it, but basically some insurers do it like a declining uh, value based on like if you're say your furnace is 15 years old they're not going to give you the, the replacement as a, a new furnace they're going to give you the value of it as an old furnace so theoretically if your house burnt down you wouldn't have enough money to buy new to, to fix everything i don't like that kind of insurance but it is cheaper um, okay. but so, so, uh, insurance is so tough because you know what's apples to apples it's, it's so hard right right yeah. so, direct comparables okay yeah so regardless i mean 1200 to 1500 you're gonna be in that ballpark yeah um and not saying that's what you have. I'm just saying that I've seen that on my end. Okay. So maintenance, I'll just throw 5% in there. Yeah. Um, water, what are you going to be into water for a year? Like so I, bucks? I, I've got a general rule where I combine water, heat and hydro for about 500 a month. 500 that, a would month? Be between, okay. that would be between the two units. Um, if it's plus okay. or minus, it's only a couple mm -hmm. hundred. It's only a hundred plus or minus the, yeah. on the month, right? Uh, I it's, like easy. That's, that's, that's yeah. great. Yeah. <laughs> My, my uh, student rentals were typically always, well, I mean, before all this, like 260 a month, uh, if they were like fully renovated, got up to 300, if it was like a six person, then it would be like 320 a month. Like it's just easy okay. to just kind of combine it. Yeah. it. Just a fun note. Do you ever get notices from your city or you're in, you're investing in London, right? And, yeah. and are you in Windsor as well? Like everyone else? Or no, not in way. Do you ever get notices from the city saying that your water consumption is too high and you should check if there's leaks or anything like that? I get them all the time at all my properties. So I feel just like curious. I have seen that. Yeah, it'll come on my bill. It'll say like, oh, your water use is high. You should check. Yeah. Yeah. Now that I've definitely seen that, but you actually get a separate letter for that. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's always a follow up with my property managers and it's okay. It's just mm -hmm. it, 90% of the time there's or, or more, there's, there's nothing going on. It's just okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's just yeah. students being students. They they use yeah, water. That's water's it. Water's an expensive one, actually. Uh, other people who some of my tenants are growing a garden, they also use a lot of water. <laughs> it's insane. Yeah. Insane the bills I see. Oh, that's a good point too, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Rain barrels are are critical. Or I mean, I was just thinking like for the price he's paying for water to water his garden, it's almost worth like us. Uh, digging in a well like even though we're in the city i don't know if the city would allow that but unreal yeah i know what you mean though it does add up i'm probably spending 150 bucks a month plus uh, per house on water yeah it's craziness but i don't know if that sounds high if i'm doing something wrong but no it's not, that's... it's not like 60 bucks a month it's not something small no, it's not that it's not that it just keeps going up and uh, yeah. because on the water bill you're paying two things you're paying for the water and you're paying for the sewer so like if you're watering your garden, you're paying for sewer on water that's not going into the sewer. And so it's just, it's really inefficient. So there's, Got there's gotta be some ways to save, save some money in there somehow. But um, anyways, getting back to this. Yeah. Um, so your cap rate based on a 725 value at the end would be about 4.6%, which is pretty solid. Um, your debt coverage ratio is about 1.3 to one, which is actually good. That, I mean, that even satisfies commercial lending guidelines. What would your, and this is based on my assumption of 2% interest rate. Is that, mm -hmm. uh, is that what you're seeing right now? Yeah, that's what I'm consistently qualifying, qualifying for at a personal level. Okay. Um, so th 30 year, 2%, 80% loan to value, that's 580. So your cash flow on this, um, if you were to buy one, just like you say, and do exactly um, what, what you said, you know, is possible right now, you could still cash flow 680. That's, 
that's pretty awesome. Right. Now, one thing I didn't bring in there is management. That, I was assuming uh, I was just going to say, so, sure. so we should, we should take a step back. Cause that's only working if you're self-managing. So what are you paying for management? You know, go at eight, 8%. And so you're taking three, you're taking 300 and change off the top there. Right. Yeah. So then when we add in management, uh, which is essential, like you're at a distance, mm -hmm. I, I mean, you can self-manage from a distance, but you still have expenses associated with it. And I, I do that on a couple of my properties, mm -hmm. Andrew, when I've like, I got lucky on one deal where I had a, I have a tenant that's paying 2,600 in rent for a whole single family home. And simply because of that, I had a nice conversation with my property managers. I'm like, look, well, I'll pay the lease up, you know, take the full 2,600 to find the right tenant and have the conversation with the tenant. Say, look, just we'll, we'll, we'll work together. Uh, I'm not going to sell the place, make it your home. You're paying good rent. You, you obviously have clear intentions of, of staying here for a while. So sometimes you get lucky and just make it easy. In that case, I didn't, uh, I didn't need to, you know, do the whole basement suite in order to, to make it cash flow because I got that one for 375. So. And you can always do that in the future too. So you don't, you don't need to yeah, do it right yeah, now. Yeah, exactly. No rush. It's, it, exactly. So. Um, yeah, that, that's a good point. I, I like that model too. Like if you've got good tenants, like I have single families, I hear nothing about <laughs> like never, ever. I have a tenant in there. She pays it's auto, it's auto withdrawal. So I don't even talk to her. She changes the furnace filters, cuts the grass, does everything. So changing the furnace filters. That's a, yeah. that's amazing. <laughs> Actually, I find most families are, are good with that. They're good with okay. changing the furnace filters. The ones that aren't good with it are the students. The students will never change the furnace no. filter. I can't but. get the students to clean their bedroom, <laughs> their common areas. Oh <laughs> no, they're, they're horrible. Are not in there. They're, they're, and uh, I, I they, say that lovingly. They're leaving, <laughs> they're leaving uh, I, I'm after them to, to take out, or my property managers are, are after them to take out the garbage that they leave in the garage out to the curb. I mean, it's another level of laziness now. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was what I was seeing at my one. Like I bought them. It was like, I think it was $2,000 for this like bear proof bin because they were leaving garbage in such quantities that raccoons were getting into it, tearing it apart, making a huge mess. I'm like, okay, guys, get to simplify this. You store your garbage in the bin and then on garbage day, just throw it into bigger bags. You get three, you get three bags and uh, throw it on the curb and uh, like, oh, okay. Yeah, that'll work. They never did it. They just fill the whole bin. And then they start, they start putting garbage uh, in separate cans beside it. Wow. Uh, yeah. It got to, yeah. I mean, it, it's students though. I mean, eventually they grow out of that and we'll do normal things, but for now, you like that as is. a student, I, I try to go back I and I talk with my property manager. Okay. <laughs> I talk with my property managers. I'm like, maybe because I was with a bit of a neat freak that got on my case, but it was just easy for us. I mean, I could stare at the garbage bin. There was a big garbage bin. I went to Bishop's University in a condensed, um, you know, uh, sort of multi-unit complex where there's a garbage bin in the middle of the uh, driveway in the parking lot, just go out, toss it in, that's it. Well, what, what's so difficult about that? And no matter what tenants I have, they're, anyway. Yeah, yeah no, I, I'm with you. I'm with you now. I look back and I'm like, was I ever really like that? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I was, I was like that. I mean, I, I was, I was, like I said, I was probably worse, but I, I had, I still had common sense and like respect. I just didn't always connect it. I didn't always think, oh, that's being disrespectful. That was just like, I don't know. I was used to maybe having my parents clean up after me a bit more. <laughs> right. So, which I think most of them are in that boat. They're just used to having other people do things for them. So it's, it's new to have to do it on your own. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. So I got 363 a month cash flow. That's pretty solid for something that you're going to have 70 grand into, which works out to be, well, let's work out that ROI. Um, you are going to have 70,000. So about a 58% return on investment including your mortgage pay down uh, right. based on a five-year average. And then I'm doing 3% um, annual appreciation, which you're probably getting much more than that. So yeah. um, again, these numbers make a lot of sense as they usually do with real estate, as long as you can make your cash flow work, which For sure. you're finding a way to do that. But are you going to keep investing at this rate? Cause I mean, this really doesn't sound too bad. I mean, I'd be, I'd be inclined to continue buying like this in that area. Cause those numbers seem to seem to be all right. Yeah, I, I am. Um, we used an example of 550 purchase price. So um, if I'm buying 550, and I'm speaking personally, always someone who's looking for a deal. And if it's on MLS, it's going to be a deal, right? Something that's mm -hmm. been on the market for too long, or just isn't getting the, um, it wasn't listed properly. It's like two bedrooms instead of the three or four that you could turn it into instantly. Um, 
you know, if I'm buying it for 550, I, I plan to get higher rents than that because it's going to be a very nice house at that price. I may mean at 500 or below. So I'm still buying in the fours now. You are, huh? Yeah. Okay, well, so you're getting really good deals. Yeah. Do you see a lot of, a lot of people flocking to Peterborough for this reason? I do because a direct comparable for, for most, and I know it's 60 kilometers away is Oshawa, but I mean, prices are just ludicrous there. There are 800,000 for a bungalow that's not converted. So oh my God. why wouldn't you drive a little further down the road? And I know it's not next door. I know it's not the next exit on the 401, right? But um, to me, as long as I see that price discrepancy, then if I see something that's brick and begins with a four and it's a raised bungalow, I buy it. I I almost don't mind no conditions because I know that um, I'm getting a deal and I don't have any anything in my way to stop me from making that offer. Mm-hmm. It, that might sound aggressive to your audience or almost irresponsible, but the truth is um, by getting it at a decent price, I'm building in that buffer, right? Yeah. And there is a contingency plan. It's, if something comes up that costs 10 20 grand, it's not going to be fun, but I'll get through it. And so will you. So just, yeah, well, it makes perfect yeah. sense to me. Like, obviously you have to have a, you have to have experience to feel comfortable with that. But mm-hmm. yeah, like once you've done so many renovations, you start to see the common problems and you know what the worst of it sort of looks like. Um, yeah. you know, if, if it's, if it's anything, um, that you can, that's not visible to the eye on a walkthrough of the house, um, in my experience, it's not something that's going to break me. But it right. uh, doesn't mean that you might not be digging a giant hole outside your foundation to fix a giant crack or sinking. Like you might have to. That so, day will come. Yeah, that day, that will, day come. will come. I've been lucky so far. Yeah. A friend of mine had that happen. There, there was uh, some issue with the footing. It was broken up and he had to you know, just dig down. So he just paid a guy to dig a hole and, and then they, yeah. they basically uh, underpinned uh, at that location, which was totally fine. It's not even a big deal. Uh, but yeah, you could probably pay a lot for that if you don't know the yeah. right people and, and you do it the wrong way. So, but uh, okay. So next on your radar then is Cornwall, but you're still looking at Peterborough. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about Cornwall and what you see as being possible. Uh, well, Cornwall, I'm seeing uh, several duplexes, triplexes go for the mid twos. And in speaking with several agents there, almost all the, um, the existing uh, buildings in the market are, under, are paying under market rent. So the, the drawbacks in this market is you don't have a, a high-end profile but you do have demand because it's becoming somewhat of a bedroom community. I I mentioned previously how the price discrepancy is just so large that, look, it's never someone's dream to move to Cornwall, no disrespect to Cornwall, (laughs) but to move to Cornwall, it's a nice waterfront, but other than that, um, in order to commute to Montreal or to commute to Ottawa, but the truth is our, our, our prices, we don't even need to go up from here uh, in Montreal or Ottawa for it to be unreasonable. I mean, I can't buy a place in Montreal here for really something that I want to live in for less than a million dollars or, mu- or much less. And, and, and I'm not talking about city center. I'm talking about outside. You know, we, we're on a big island here. And um, Ottawa is very expensive as well. So if you could buy a nice house for, like, really nice house for $400,000, why not do it there? I see long-term growth with the uh, increased uh, commuting uh, aspect that we find ourselves in today. I, mm-hmm. I know that COVID's eventually ending, but the truth is there's, you know, many employees are flexible on uh, working, working outside the office. So um, I think that's going to, it's tr- going to turn into a bedroom community. The real estate's too cheap there and it's an easy source of cash flow. I'm right there with you on that. I think there's so much going for Cornwall. Like you said, I know kind of tongue in cheek, it's not anyone's dream, but at the same time, it does have the water. It does have the 401. So those are two um, shipping corridors. So, you know, you can ship out of, uh, out of both. And then you've got the central uh, kind of location between both Ottawa and Montreal. So yeah, it's not great if you're working in those cities, but if you are allowed to work from home, Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of a no brainer for a lot of people. Well, let's say uh, work for, two days from home or three days from home and commute yeah. the other two days. Yeah. A lot of people would be okay with that. I know people that do that live in London and commute to Toronto a couple of days a week. So, I mean, why wouldn't you do that with a place like Cornwall? 
I think, I mean, I've, I've been saying this over and over again. I just think any market like that is bound to, to shoot up like crazy. I'm surprised it hasn't already through all this madness of the, uh, of the uh, well, lockdown where everything just exploded. Um, yet somehow well, the funny thing, didn't. Andrew, yeah. the funny thing is it has, you just don't notice it because it's so much like when it, when it, when it appreciates from 20, even if it's appreciating at 20 or 30% a year, like it's their so starting lower. prices were like 150. So if it goes up to 200, it's like, yeah. okay, so what, you know, yeah. get the 400 and then we'll talk. But um, that's why that, that's what does attract me. Uh, a, a couple of, very quick stories is I, I had a couple of off-market deals. Uh, one got intercepted from a lawyer. So I literally had the, the seller agree to a price. I was going to buy uh, a, a side-by-side -side duplex for 240K. Mm -hmm. Lawyer just comes right in and says, I'll offer you 250, gone. <laughs> so I talked with my, with my lawyer and say, hey, can I, can I do anything about this? Can I sue the guy? I'm like, eh, it's not worth it. So that one went through and then um, an, an off market deal with, uh, with bliss on uh, from okay. Luke Byron's team. Uh, really good one that I was looking forward to closing on. And uh, unfortunately we will go into details, but the, the, the seller ultimately refused to sell. So we're considering taking some, uh, some legal action and, and that's that, but uh, I'm over two in Cornwall. I'm not a quitter, so I'll get there. And um as Peterborough becomes tougher to buy, I'll, I'll always have an excuse in Cornwall. It's also only an hour away, right? It feels good to finally buy a cash flow property that's an hour away from me. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know where that would be an hour from me, but uh, I'm getting okay with the distance. I'm, it's just you have to be able to take the time and just make sure your systems are set up right. But then it's okay to be at a distance. Um, yeah, I, I think I just overcompensated back the other way because. Uh, what I have, what happened the first time I invested in the U S I just never wanted to be far away from my properties again. Yeah. I get but, that. Uh, it's something you got to get over. Like, I, I think that, cause we all want to live where we want to live, but that doesn't necessarily make it the best place to invest. And, it's not, it's not. Yeah, exactly. Like Usually it wouldn't it make sense of me. Like, I mean, Unless maybe you're a few born years in ago. Hamilton, it's not. <laughs> yeah. But even Hamilton, <laughs> like there are people who were investing in Hamilton. Now they're going up to Sudbury. Like, yeah. They don't, they don't want to pay this, this, uh, this dollar range. And, uh, you know, Sudbury is doing what you just described in Cornwall. I mean, it still yes. seems really low, but it's exploded from what it was. Yeah. Well, that's because Dylan Sue keeps buying there. He's yeah. got to stop buying there. We got to blame he's him and Robbie the have just <laughs> they've they're ruined just it. Buying the whole town. They're cornering the market. So I think they bought a golf course too. Robbie was saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's funny. It's funny. Like, I, I feel like I'm not trying to toot my horn here, but we start talking about stuff on this show. And then I keep hearing investors that listen to this show say, Oh, I just picked one up there. And I'm not saying I cause it, but I, I think I help grease the wheels to make, to make, you know, some people focus on certain areas by talking about them, which, right. Hey, that's the natural yeah. thing that happens uh, in this yeah. investor world. Uh, well, yeah, cool I agree with you that, that you need to, I, I agree that we need to adapt. So you, you know, you, you've got something going on with your, your key market. You've got your team built there. You've got everything set up there, but at a certain price point, if you can't make the numbers work and there are other opportunities, um, why not? Why not start to look for that other network where uh, that, that other market where you can start building that network when you did it in one place, just do it again in another. Yeah. And it has more of a, a laneway, right? It has a runway, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. Like you, I could buy in Cornwall for the next five years and still cash flow in properties in, in five years, even if we see heavy, heavy appreciation, just because yeah. it started so low. Well, let's talk about what market rent would be like for, for the target product you're looking for. Yeah, so I would be looking at buying duplexes or triplexes that have two bedrooms where I'd be able to get about a thousand or 1200 per unit that are currently being rented at like six or 700, um, you know, tenant turnover, cosmetic work of, uh, painting, flooring, all that easy stuff, uh, yeah. would be able to likely lift the, the market rents by, uh, lift the, the rents by $300 a unit. Okay, so say you could get something for two hundred and fifty thousand, that would already be a duplex. Yeah. Okay, and then yeah. you'd be renovating well, like twenty five grand or something, twenty grand. Uh, yeah, at, at the most. Okay, we'll call it twenty grand. Uh, so you're in for like two seventy. Um, 
after you yeah. get those and those we can take done. this one for example yeah. like i was uh, was he getting um about 900 in one and like 1300 mm -hmm. in the other so just call it a little over a thousand but purchase price of 250 okay that's what the lawyer got it for i was gonna get it for 240 okay so you had a firm deal on that and the lawyer sniped it from you no it wasn't a firm deal i basically uh sent him my paperwork say show this to your lawyer you know our lawyers connect this is how we transact off market oh. right i was walking him through the process are you getting it now is it it's yeah. the interception the, the, his so his lawyer, lawyer said, huh. was getting used for uh, advice and a lawyer sniped the deal from you <laughs> right <laughs> i mean i have to laugh about it now right yeah. like it's just done so it's all yeah. good that's incredible that that happened yeah um, that sounds like bar grievance ter territory is it not um what territory sorry bar grievance oh like they agree oh. to the law society oh you know what uh i just it could be i just don't want to go down that rabbit hole where i get frustrated and and, and seek legal counsel to find you know um no i know i know yeah, uh, yeah that, that yeah, would it, be no more than than an, a half hour of my time to just fill out a form and and mail it off and say this is what this guy did a uh, half hour well, i'm gonna give him a call and yeah. and just tell him what I thought about what he did, not, not in a angrily mm -hmm. way, in a very calm, you know, yeah. professional, Hey bud, this is my business and this is what you did. Just wasn't cool. Yeah. Thanks very much. I'm going to be investing around you the next few years because you've got a great market. And uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, it's unprofessional, but look, things happen. Mm -hmm. I, I reached out to my network, um, you know, Corey and his students and say, Hey guys, this happened to me. Did, did any, has anyone ever gone through that? And I think, uh, Whalen and Austin have, have had that before. Benji, you do enough deals. You're going to have a few, um, intercepted. Yeah. And it's an unfortunate part of the business. It was just right before your own eyes. I guess if I were to do it differently, I would have had the offer submitted like through, through my lawyer. And if, if it was submitted through my lawyer and it was intercepted from the other lawyer, then, there'd likely be some, uh, uh, can I call it a thicker paper yeah. trail where it's like, a little it's bit not of just me on the back of a napkin. Thing. Right. So, yeah. That's, that's too gonna... bad. But I mean, these, these guys are probably pretty diligent and know what they can get away with. So, uh, but I agree yeah. with you Un unprofessional, not, not what you want to see. Um, okay. So had you done that, done the little $20,000 reno, what do you think? Like, do you think an appraiser would have supported an excess value or would they really just be giving you what you paid plus your reno? Uh, no, I, it would have, uh, refinanced for a 350, 375. Okay. So we'll say 350. According to a realtor. Okay. So, so especially, especially it being side by side, right? This is not an up and down, um, typical duplex side, side by side is valued. Wow. Okay. Higher, so you, you'd get all your money separation. out on that. You would have got all your money oh, out on that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. No question. Okay. So let's just say hypothetically, that's what happened. So, uh, 350, um, Rent, so rents are still kind of low for that valuation though. Um, so 2,400, what yeah. would your taxes be? Uh, very low, like 1,500. And then insurance would be similar. We'll just Yeah, say... let's go 1,500 as well. Okay, okay Maybe. so 1,500. Yeah. yeah, and then maintenance will... I've got 5% there, but it might actually be a bit higher because that's pretty low rents uh, relative. Um, are you going to still be figuring $6,000 for utilities for the year? 500 a month. Yes. I, I would even pop them up to 600 just because these are two, like three bedroom places, you know, with and your not separate profile, you could have a few. They actually were. Okay. So in that case, would, would the 2,400 be plus utilities? Uh, yeah, I, I would have done. That's a good point. Sorry. Yeah. You're bringing back to the property. So yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we'll just leave that one as a zero on the utilities management. Would you self-manage or you're going to pay the 8%? No, I'm paying a property manager there. 8% still. Yes. Okay. Um, based on that, then your cap rate's actually pretty good. You know, 5.9%, um, really okay. good debt coverage ratio, 1.66 to one. Uh, based on 2%, again, 30 year amortization, 80% loan to value at 280,000. So you're going to have like 690 a month cash flow. That's good. Yeah, it's strong. I mean, it's just the purchase price, right? Uh, yeah. Most people are looking at duplexes and they're buying them for 500, 600,000, and that's okay. So when you're buying it at 250, yeah, uh, just changes the numbers completely. 
Absolutely, it does. I mean, it kind of makes me want to go to Cornwall, although I've said this before. <laughs> Come on down. <laughs> how, would, uh, how would someone at a distance, I mean, you're actually close to Cornwall, but if you were coming at it from a distance, if you were five hours away from it, how would you approach it? I would uh, reach out in my network to see who's investing in Cornwall, what the, um, who their property managers and contractors are, uh, potentially do a JV with them to start out. If, if not, I would ask them for referrals and, and get to it. I like that you said that because that's what that was my strategy in Florida. And no one ever told me that. I'm like, I think I need to JV with one of these people. Otherwise, I'm never going to learn what I need to learn quick enough. And yep. uh, so that was what I decided. Okay, I'm just going to JV with a guy who knows what he's doing. I'll fund it. And he, uh, and he can do all the work and I'll just be the fly on the wall the whole time. And just why reinvent the wheel? So, yeah, and you, you see the value also of your own time. It's, it's as though at the beginning, I think we've come past the point where, where um, we, we need to have 100% of every deal. If you, if you can partner with an expert and you're, you, know, you respect their ability and, and they have that credibility, um, no one's preventing you from getting the second, third, fourth property on your own if you feel you can mm -hmm. do it and they're not adding that value. Right. But you're a busy guy. Um, yeah. Do you want to be either managing or tr trusting relationships from the get go in Southern Florida from, from where you yeah. are? Probably not. Oh no, no, never, never going to work. Um, I, but I will after, after I get set up, once I already yeah. have those connections made, that'll be a lot easier, but um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I find the one thing that you got to be delicate about is I don't want to ever mislead someone. So I, I had to say to the guy, like, I, I do intend to do this on my own as well, but I, I see a value for both of us to do one together. And yeah. he was agreeable to that. Uh, but I don't think everybody would be like, is that your experience? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, I am open to it. So I've got coming up on five joint venture partners and I, I tell them this is something that, uh, I'm doing where our target is to buy a, a property or two properties every year. And if at any point, you know, you want to spread your wings and fly on your own, I'm not going to be holding you back. I encourage you to do it on your own because you can get, you can make more money on your own. But if this is someone who's working a nine to five job, they like their career, they've got a family and uh, a, a property or five is just going to, uh, you know, take up too much of their time then it's not the right decision to, you have to value your time at, at some point. If not your, yeah. your life uh, it gets thrown out of balance, out of whack. I'm starting to experience that now. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm really I, I, at that point. You know, <laughs> I'm yeah, really no, but I get, and, but I'm, I tell people I'm having fun at the same time, but yeah, it's like, what am I doing this morning? I'm filling out an insurance form for, uh, you know, another property. It's like, I don't want to be doing, all these little small things and I've outsourced most, but you know what I mean? It's, um, it's just something that you want to, uh, you got to set those, those barriers, those walls, those lines in the sand. And um, yeah, but getting back to your question, I, I never am defensive about introducing my joint venture partners to all the people that I work with uh, because yeah. um, my, why, you know? Well, I, I know the, the contractor, uh, possessiveness that some people have like, Oh, my contractors are busy helping me. I don't have time to yep. help you, <laughs> which I think yep. is a real thing. So you don't, you don't have any worry that your contractor won't have time. For no, you. I, I, well, you're, you're speaking to me at a time where I've got four part, you know, four projects lined up with the right contractor. And I'll put it this way. I have my commitment through him that he's going to execute for me and not for someone else. Mm -hmm. So uh, what that means is that, yes, of course, I can make the introduction and we're all friends here. But at the end of the day, uh, his commitment is to me and he mm -hmm. will likely not squeeze in jobs or mislead new clients into timelines that they're going to want that he can't achieve. Yeah. And that's part of this game. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think as uh, as they get in, if they if they get in with them you know, if, if they treat each other well, then over time they might develop a relationship and he, and he may give them tra treatment like you get, but that will take time. And I think gratefully, so you've built that, that relationship up. You did the work. It's not right for somebody to come in and expect to get, you know, everything that you built, but all the same, yeah. it's totally cool if they want to spread their wings. Right. 
Yeah. I'm trying to think of what else we talked about last time. I mean, you, you're just talking about the minutia, man, do I ever relate? Like, I just don't like doing any of that stuff. Uh, but part of me just thinks, okay, I just need to schedule one hour undistracted and just crush out all these little minute tasks for the day. Um, are you looking at admins or are you using one now? Or are Yeah, you I'm, I'm going to start to, I'm, I'm getting some help because, um, you know, I, I do work my nine to five and I, I need that support. So on the small stuff, you know, at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, and uh, basically just keep steer my focus in the right direction. I am looking at um, getting uh, getting some support there, though, professionally, whether it's a, a virtual assistant like uh, uh, to to do just clerical tasks, uh, mm-hmm. respond to emails, things like filling out forms and stuff like that that need some guidance and instruction, but aren't very difficult. Right. Yeah. Um, finding the the challenging part sometimes is things need to be done by me right and it's like when you need to go to the bank it's you who needs to go to the bank it's not someone else um mm-hmm. uh, vali- you know the validity of um uh, uh of representing yourself is you just can't really be substituted yeah. so um but how often do you really yeah. need to go to the bank i mean i guess just cashing bank drafts mm-hmm. right checks can be cashed on the phone i use automatic uh payment so i can do like direct deposit yeah for, for most things yeah, wherever i can so it's how often are you going to the bank what are you doing no you're, you're you're right i mean uh, i'm usually able to get away with it on the de- without deposits now i'm able to do e-transfer at times but sometimes depending on the law firm there there's stick sticklers about it being a draft um but no like that's it's yeah. not it's not too frequent enough that uh, it's a distraction it's just yeah all the little things kind of add up. They and, do. Yeah. yeah like I, I've said this before, but my biggest hesitation is just the personal stuff, like the, you know, giving over passwords or just the daunting task of having to go change every password I use to something yeah. that I'd be comfortable sharing, which I can then yeah. change again if there's a problem. You know, do you, do you let somebody into your online banking or no? I mean, my in gut is no, <laughs> but yeah. that's, there's a cost to that. You know, by not yeah. doing that, I cost myself time. Yeah, and, uh, that's right. Yeah. So I'm all, I'm all for it. Like where, wherever I can, where it's not that stuff, but then I'll have that fear of like, okay, well, how much work do I really have for that person then? If, if I'm not going to give them the stuff that's, you know, password sensitive, then how much do I really have for them? Well, how are you going to scale without mm-hmm. giving, uh, you know, out- outsourcing a lot of these tasks that you're doing yourself due to trust Good issues? Question. Good question. <laughs> I think at the end of the day, I, it's an experiment. I didn't mean no to grind, grind. No, but you're right. Just, uh, no, but you are right. It depends you on your goals. Right. If your goals are to get to a hundred, or I don't know what you're at, but 200, 300 yeah. units, yeah. be the next lawfler, then you can't do it all yourself. No, absolutely not. No. And, and that is, that is the next step. I'm, uh, these are just some of the issues that I, I, I do see. And I, and I know other people are probably have some, some level of commonality there in terms of their feelings as well. Um, but yeah, it is absolutely what needs to happen and no one knows how it'll work out. I, I think I'm, I'm kind of coming to this conclusion because of what I've realized with my other employees is you never realize all the benefits they can bring until you bring them in and you see that they're a good fit and they, they work, they work with my goals, you know, Rod, my, my, uh, site super, he's keen. He knows, he knows what's, what's going on. He, he can really think on his own and he doesn't need <clears> me to think for him. And I always encourage that. And, and, the amazing benefits that have come from that, um, man, I, I wouldn't want to do it without them. So yeah. I need to, I need to take that, you know, the, the next step too, and, and keep, keep on that train. And, uh, nice. yeah, so maybe we can do that together. We'll, uh, we'll have to share secrets for sure. <laughs> yeah. Are you thinking, so you are thinking executive, like, uh, like virtual assistant or, or potentially someone something like that, that to just take care of paperwork, uh, Would they be Canadian or and- like foreign. I prefer Canadian, just mm. I don't want anything lost in translation or, uh, you know, scheduling the timing of things. Sometimes things need to be done now and mm. um, or, or just fairly time sensitive. And uh, yeah, I, I just would prefer to, uh, to hire a Canadian just to make it easier. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, definitely, it doesn't uh, make a big difference for me to, you know, pay someone, I don't know what it is on these sites, but you know, $5 versus $15 an hour. I just want someone to be reliable. It costs me a lot more if I'm paying $5 an hour and I have to explain something 10 times. True. 
but if it's the purpose, if at $5 an hour, you get full time and they're undistracted and they're only for you, well then right. there is a benefit there, but I, mm-hmm. I, I do see what you're saying. I mean, 15, as long as they don't, they're not thinking they're going to get full time and they're still okay with being responsive. Yeah. Uh, I think that that can work too. So uh, yeah. I guess you'll have to let me know how that goes. Cool. <laughs> we'll do. Yeah. So, I'll check it out. You've, uh, you've made a recent change. You were telling me you're working for a new employer now. Yeah, I joined uh, the building stack team. So what we do is uh, property management software. So um, my previous job was in software sales as well. So it was a great fit in the sense that, you know, just learning the SaaS world, how you're adding value to your clients. And I've been around real estate for 10 years. So, uh, you know, my skills are best suited towards helping investors, owners, property managers, uh, optimize managing their place, right? So... Mm-hmm. At the beginning, like my first couple of properties using Excel and Gmail, I mean, that's fine for a few units, but I'm finding that as you expand, you get to 10, 20 units and plus, then you want to centralize information. And uh, I actually connected with the owner, Jonathan Margell, like five or six years ago. And I always liked his idea. He, he's been working on it for, for 10 years now. So it's a startup that's been around for 10 years. Um, Canadian company as well born and raised out of Montreal. So that's nice. And yeah, it just basically uh, helps landlords centrally manage their property through online advertising, uh, communicating between employees and tenants whenever there are issues or whenever you're making improvements. So tenants can uh, fill out like requests for repairs and stuff like that. Yeah. It's called tickets so they can create a ticket. It's time stamped. It's, uh, you know, we can communicate through uh, text, voicemail or email. And it, it's basically a centralized system that gets everyone on the same page. Mm-hmm. Um, now I know I don't manage my own properties, but all my property managers now use this. So I have a portal, right? I've got some insight where I can dive in, see what's going on, who's paid rent, who hasn't um, any notes that uh, are are recent regarding any maintenance issues, anything to look mm-hmm. out for, any upcoming vacancies. So it'll give you a heads up if uh, someone's lease is going to expire three months from now, you might want to start marketing it now. So just treating it like a real yeah. business it is. And yeah, I, I like find that. that at the beginning, and, and it's easy to say now because I've progressed a bit, but it really helps if you start treating it like a business from day one. And I, I never did that. I just thought, okay, it's an investment. Um, you just invest money and you spend your time on it to make sure that that building makes money over time. But when you think about it, that's no different than a business. It's just, it's a tiny business, right? Mm. And we're buying lots of tiny businesses uh, for investors like us and uh, our network. I mean, some are into multifamily, of course, which we support, but they're all just a bunch of little businesses that add up, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And there are, I've heard of a few types of software that, that do that, but, and I, I've used one, um, although I'd never used it for that reason. I just use it for the automatic withdrawal. Do you guys have that in yours okay. as well? Does it have like the banking it's, integration? Yeah. So we, uh, there, we have a, a tenant portal that allows tenants to go in, create those tickets that we discussed and yeah. pay their rent online, but also yeah. have it pre-authorized. So it's set up once a month. Yeah. Um, they're able to pay by a debit credit or bank and banks the cheapest. We've got great payment terms. So it just makes it 100% yeah, easy to, to communicate with the tenant as well. So like at the beginning, it almost feels good, right? You're an excited new investor where uh, you've got a couple of units and you're, you're texting and you're calling your, your yeah. tenants when, then there's, when there's issues. But once you scale out, you don't want, you want your time to be respected in the sense that if you can have an online portal where people are, that people are consistently using Mm -hmm. to communicate, it's helpful for everyone. Right. So when I get a message from you, I don't have to play broken telephone and call someone else. We're all on the same page. Uh, It's just effective communication. Like I said, I started that WhatsApp group in Peterborough. We're about 60, 70 investors now on that WhatsApp group because I want it all there. Like if I, if I have a question about, what's going on, uh, whether it's strategy, the right contractor, the right property manager, the right, whatever. I ask a question, six people answer. Yeah. That's amazing. You know, within, so why not have that instant, um, 
communication on a software for all your properties. If you can, it's, it's pretty ideal. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's uh, the centralization is amazing. That's not, that's actually a really good fit for you too. being, being in the business in your personal life where you're investing. And then you're also doing that for a, for a day job. Yeah. A nice, nice it provides credibility. There. I mean, my, yeah. my property managers were using this before I joined building stack and uh, yeah. I, I love it. So it's yeah, great. That's really cool. Um, okay. Jared, if, if people wanted to, to get in touch with you, where do we send them? Yeah, I really like being reached out through Instagram, Jared H55. It's just an easy way to uh, get a hold of me. And my new business email is jared at buildingstack.com. That's J A R E D at okay. buildingstack.com. And if anyone is has any questions about real estate at all whatsoever, I'm always happy to chat. Awesome, man. Well, this has been uh, been fun. It's always nice catching up with you. We, Likewise. Uh, we have good conversations. Uh, anything else you wanted to share? Just kind of words of wisdom before we wrap up here? Make sure the numbers work according to Andrew's Excel sheet and then just buy. Don't wait. Yeah. Yeah. You got to keep it Take moving. action. Got to keep it moving. That's for sure. Got to okay. keep it moving. Jared, thanks a lot, man. This has been great. Thanks, Andrew. Appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. Please make sure to share this episode far and wide. Help it help more people. I really appreciate you tuning in. Thanks. I'll see you on the next one. Okay.